Hi, my name is Glenn Ingram and I work for the British Deer Society in the role of Deer Officer. Uh, the Society has been around for over 50 years. We have a branch network around the UK, around 6,000 members. And we provide a service giving advice, providing education and training and advocacy in all deer related matters. Today we're here at the Holcombe Estate in North Norfolk uh, where I'm going to talk to you briefly about the six species of deer that we have in the UK, a little bit, bit about their history and distribution and we'll have a look at some antlers and talk about some of the facts and figures related to them. Here we are in a mixed woodland on the estate. Deer have an effect on woodland by browsing and grazing. They also have an effect on farmland and the impact they have varies depending on the species and the numbers involved. Many people will welcome deer in the countryside, but it does bring them into conflict with foresters and farmers. We need to manage our wildlife, and particularly our deer, so that we can minimise that impact and make sure that the populations we have are appropriate for the environment. One of the ways we can estimate the abundance, and to a certain extent the species of deer present in a woodland, is by looking at the impact that they have on the flora. Here behind me we can see some ivy growing up a tree, up higher where the deer can't reach, in this case Rowan Muntjac, uh, it's bushy and vigorous. Down lower where they've uh, browsed it off, there's much less of it. Let's take a look at some of the species in more detail. We'll start with the red deer. Like I said, our largest land mammal. The males are called stags and this is a fine example of a red deer stag. We call the females hinds and the young are known as calves. These dramatic, impressive antlers that we see are incredible. There's a common misconception that they grow a point each year. That's not the case. One thing that is for sure is that the antlers that a stag grows are determined by, certain, to a certain extent, his genetics, but also the nutrition that he can get. Here in East Anglia, we grow some fine red deer. And this is an example of quite a young but well-formed stag. Here I've got a Parkland antler. From a, from a stag that lived in the park here at Holcombe. You can see it's significantly heavier and much more multi-pointed. It's a good example and one thing we should look at here is the fact that it's a cast antler. So deer antlers are grown every year and then they're cast. Here we see the cast end near the coronet where it grows from the, uh, the, the animal's head. It's cast and then regrows and it grows in about 100 days. The fastest bone growth in the animal kingdom. It's important to note that these antlers are made of bone, just like the bones in our arms and legs in that, and in the rest of the animal's skeleton. This is not a deer at all, it's a feral goat. And the reason I brought this along is to illustrate the difference between antlers and horns. Horns grow on animals like goat, sheep, cattle and antelope. The horns are made of keratin, like our fingernails and our hair. And they, they're not cast and regrown, they grow throughout the animal's life. If this uh, goat was to break his horn, he would be stuck with a broken horn for the remainder of his life. Whereas with a, a red deer stag, or any deer antler, he only has to uh, tolerate a broken antler until the next time he casts, and then a new one grows. Having spoken about the red deer, it's appropriate that we move on to the Japanese seeker. Seeker are the same genus as red deer, which means they can interbreed. They're the only two species of UK deer that can interbreed. And it does present problems, particularly in Scotland. You can see the same structure, branched antlers, no palmation, no flattening like we'll see later in fallow, but much smaller antlers. Whilst we've got the animal in front of us, it's worth looking at the colour. This dark colour comes from the environment. So when the animal has finished growing his antlers, when they're growing, they're covered in, in velvet, a fine furry skin. When that velvet's shed, they, they're white, and they soon start to take the colour from the vegetation around them. By size comparison, we call them a medium-sized deer, but they're very stocky and bulky in nature, probably around half the size of a red deer. We can see the antlers, by comparison, are about half the size here too. Their coat changes dramatically from winter to summer. In the winter their coat's thick and dark and the stags in particular go almost black but they do have a white rump and they have white markings on their metatarsal glands down on their hock. They're spotty in the summer and are often mistaken for fallow deer. Fallow are a medium sized deer, very common in our deer parks with their beautiful coats 
um, but also very common in the wild and widely distributed in the UK. In some areas, in the East Midlands particular, there's large numbers, big herds, sometimes numbering in, in the hundreds. Fallow deer have this distinctive palmated antler. They're the only one of the UK species that have this flattened palmated antler in the males. And interestingly, as we look through the antlers, we can identify different names for the different age classes. So this buck we would call a pricket. It's his first set of antlers, generally single spikes, in his second year of life. He casts that, regrows, we call him a sorrel. The following year, we call him a saw. This is usually where we start to see the palmation developing. This is a particularly good one. The next year, we see more length added, a little more complexity, we call him a bear buck. He moves on a year and becomes a buck, and then for all subsequent years, we call him a great buck. And again, this is quite a good antler, quite a good animal. Fallow are what we call a naturalised deer. So they're not a native species, but they have been here a long time. They were initially brought to the UK by the Romans in small numbers, and later by the Normans. The Normans were a great hunting race, and that's where we see the first history of deer parks uh, stocked with fallow and other animals. Roe deer are, in my opinion, probably our prettiest deer, and one that I find fascinating. I've been fortunate to work with them in various areas of the country. They're a very adaptable species, and they're equally at home in gardens, um, public parks sometimes, even graveyards, uh, normal deciduous woodland like we see here, or in the uplands in commercial forestry plantations. They do very well wherever they're found. They're a small deer, and like we've said before, one of our natural species, and they're incredible little animals. They tend to give birth to twins, sometimes singletons, sometimes tri triplets, um, but most frequently twins. And their distribution, being a territorial deer, they've spread right across the UK. Um, very, very common animal. Generally brown in colour, beautiful fox red in the summer. Moving on from roe deer, being probably our most widespread deer, onto our least widely distributed one, which is a Chinese water deer. These are our smallest uh, deer. They're certainly in smallest in weight, lightest in weight. Uh, unique in that they have no antlers. Both the males and the females have those long canine tusks, much larger in the males, but no antlers. The distribution is limited really to East Anglia uh, and some isolated pockets elsewhere. Due to the fact that they escaped from deer parks at Woburn and, and Whipsnade in Bedfordshire uh, and popula populated the country around them. The habitat up here in East Anglia with reed beds and agricultural fields and some, some open areas suits them really well, although they're quite happy in woodland too. They're probably the uh, least important deer of the UK species from an agricultural and a forestry impact point of view, but interestingly they are one that we're watching very closely for increases in their distribution. Another unique feature about Chinese water deer is the fact that they give birth to multiple fawns. So they rut in December and then in, uh, in the late spring, early summer, give birth to fawns, but they could be two, three, four even in a litter rather than just one or two like we might see in the other species. We're very keen to monitor the distribution of all of our deer and in fact the British Deer Society has been doing this for over 50 years now. Every five years we conduct an in-depth study, but we also have an app where members and members of the public can download information, they can find information about the deer, but also they can report sightings which are really helpful to help us gain a, a picture of the UK deer distribution. The last species we're going to take a look at is the Reeves muntjac, also introduced to the UK and again introduced to Bo Woburn in Bedfordshire. These are very small deer too, just like the Chinese water deer. Similar in height, but more stocky. A little brown deer with a tail that when they're running away from you, the tail bobs up erect, um, and very often they'll bark at you. You'll hear them barking in the woods for no reason or when disturbed. Muntjac have canine tusks, like the Chinese water deer, but they also have antlers. Generally simplistic, single spikes, or sometimes spikes with brow tines like these.
Muntjac are unique in that they can breed all year round, so it's not unusual to see fawns at any time of the year. Interestingly, you might be able to see from this skull, here's the area where the large suborbital gland uh, is situated. And this just illustrates what a world of scent the deer live in. They're frequently marking their territories, um, smelling the activities of other deer, uh, and it, give, it gives them a real insight into each other's lives. Scent is really important to all deer, and if we're approaching them or, or moving around the woods, it's really important to be stalking into the wind so that they don't smell us before we get to them. I hope you've enjoyed that. We're really fortunate in the UK to have the six species of deer that we have, plus the captive ones that you can visit in deer parks and collections. Joining the National Gamekeepers organisation is a choice for all shooters and gamekeepers. Help promote, protect gamekeeping, conservation and shooting as we know it today. Get on the front foot. Support an organisation that will defend what you love and we do. NGO membership comes with £10 million of third party liability, a dedicated firearms licensing team, legal support, as well as many, many other members' benefits. Be part of Britain's biggest conservation movement.